to offer the process. There we go, we're, we're recording. Um, it is also the first funeral home to offer the process of natural organic reduction, also known as human composting, which gently transforms humans into soil after death. Anna Swenson is the outreach manager for Recompose and leads education, PR, marketing, and public policy. She also assists in expansion efforts, investor relations, and anything else that needs a checklist or a copy edit. Anna joined Recompose as its first employee after several okay. years at PR Hello. agencies representing tech and startup companies. Originally from Arizona, oh, yeah. she began her work in end-of-life care in 2015 with a nonprofit in Phoenix, providing respite and palliative care for children and families. And before we get started, I just wanted to ask everyone to please be sure to mute, mute yourselves. And uh, we didn't get a chance to ask Anna this about how she wants to take questions. So if you wouldn't mm -hmm. mind addressing that when you get started, Anna, that muted. will help us. Now I'm muted Great. again. Sure. Yeah. Um, I well, I picture, agree. So. I'm going to, I look see. like I can ask the co host mute people. So if I mute you, please don't be offended. <laughs> okay. Sounds like we're better on feedback now. So you can, um, in terms of questions, I, I'll have some time at the end for questions, and that's probably the easiest for me so that I don't get distracted. But if you want to put them in the chat, I can um, try to address them at the end. So um, you can drop them in the chat throughout if you want, and then I'll address them at the end. I do usually get to everyone's questions by the end, so um, keep that in mind. And I think we're good to go. So today I'm here to tell you about human composting. Uh, which is a process that transforms humans into soil. And I'm gonna tell you about the science of how it works, as well as the environmental benefits of this option, as well as why you might choose it and what it's like to choose Recompose. So if you wanna learn more about what I'm talking about today, you can call us. We have a regular phone number, call us anytime. And that's my email. And we also have a website that has extensive amounts of information about everything I'm gonna cover. And as you heard from the bio, I was Recompose's first employee in 2019, and now we're up to 20, I think. So we are growing quickly, and we're hiring for four different roles. If you know anyone interested, they can check out our website as well. So how does human composting work? Always the first question people ask when they hear about what we're doing. So. I'll explain the process to you in pretty simple terms, and then I'll also address some of the most common questions that we hear. So if we start in this little wheel diagram up at the 12 o'clock position there with the little pile of wood chips, the natural organic production process takes place when we place a plant material. We use wood chips, alfalfa, and straw, and we place the body and the plant material into a cradle. You can see that moving to the about three o'clock position here on the wheel and the body and the plant material are placed in what we call a vessel down to the next step of this diagram. That honeycomb shaped container is what we call a vessel. And it's the microbes that naturally occur on our bodies and on that plant material that transform the body into soil. So the body and the plant material is placed in that vessel and it remains in that vessel for about 30 days. And during that time, the vessel gets up to a temperature of over 131 degrees Fahrenheit. And that is what powers the transformation into soil. The change takes place on a molecular level. So it eliminates pathogens, it eliminates chemotherapy. Anything that might be in the body at the time of death is eliminated by the time the soil is finished. So the body stays in that vessel for about 30 days. It is an aerobic process. Oh, I think we have some more people on sound. Just make sure to mute if you could, please. Thank you. And so the plant material and the body are in the vessel for about 30 days, and that is the transformation into soil. And then we remove that soil to test it, to remove non-organics such as hip implants or other implants in the body. And there's also a drying and curing process. So between the time that the body goes into the vessel and when the soil is complete is between six and eight weeks. And it creates a cubic yard of soil. So it's a quite a bit of soil created. And that's because we put about three cubic yards of plant material into the vessel to power that transformation into soil. So 
In Washington state, the soil can be used the same as cremated remains. You just have to have permission of the landowner and it is legally and scientifically compost. You can use it on trees and plants. And then those trees can become wood chips and go back into the vessel. So you can see it as a true returning to the earth. And we offer families the option to either take the soil home if they want, or we have a forest partner where folks can donate the soil and it's used for conservation efforts. Well, that was a lot of information. So here's the slide that I put in here to make sure that I said everything. And this photo here is an open vessel down at our facility in Kent. So those rails on the side are where we would roll in the cradle, which is what we call the um, bed that the body sits on. And then we close up the front of the vessel and that's where the transformation into soil takes place. And those microbes are what creates heat of over 131 Fahrenheit. And that is the threshold that is required by the state to ensure that everything is broken down. People always ask, what about the bones? This is by far our most common question. And yes, the bones and teeth do break down. We do a turning of this vessel, sort of like a very slow clothes dryer towards the end of the process. And then we also do screen at the end to ensure that there aren't any bone fragments that would be going back to families, which is similar to what happens with flame-based cremation. So there are a few diseases that disqualify a person from choosing this process. They are Ebola, prion diseases, tuberculosis, and radiation seed treatment within 30 days of death. So those are a few relatively rare conditions that disqualify a person from undergoing this just because there isn't quite enough science that the soil would then be safe. And in the case of Ebola and prion diseases, those people have to undergo flame-based cremation. It results in a dark soil that's um, just like the compost you'd get at a garden store. Our founder and CEO, Katrina Spade, tells a story about you know, when she was first doing this, she was convinced that this was going to be very special compost. It was going to be better than all compost. And our soil scientist, Dr. Lynn Carpenter Boggs from Washington State University says, no, it's good compost, but it's just compost. And I always think that's sort of a nice reminder that, you know, humans are organic matter too. <laughs> So here is a picture of the box that we give back to families. This is a 64 ounce container that we can send through the mail to whoever would like to have the soil or people can um, offer to, sorry, it looks like we're getting some markup here on the screen. Um, anyway, this is a pile of soil that um, folks can use to build trees and plants. It can be used on conservation work and I have some more detail about that work as well. So this is our vessels. Um, this is our 10 vessel array, that's what we call it. And this is where the transformation into soil takes place down at our current location in Kent. There's actually another array behind this. So we have the capacity to turn 16 bodies per month into soil. Oh, I see Judith in the chat has a question. How do you deal with implanted devices? So most can go into the vessel and then we'll remove them when we screen the soil. There is one that has to be removed before they go into a vessel and that is pacemakers because they have electrical elements and those are removed by our licensed funeral directors. And that's the same as for cremation. Pacemakers are removed before cremation. Thanks Judith. So a little bit more about our facility in Kent. It's been open since late 2020 and we have transformed over a hundred bodies into soil there. It's a full service facility that offers the transformation into soil. We can store bodies in cold storage and we also stream virtual layings in from there. It is not open to the public. It is a quite industrial space. So that's why we don't have families there. But the good news is that we are getting very close to opening our next location, which will be open to the public. Our Seattle HQ will open in May. We're just waiting on a building permit, which if anyone's in construction knows that are very slow right now, but it will be in the Soto neighborhood of Seattle and it will have the capacity to turn about 50 bodies per month into soil when it's fully up and running probably this summer. And um, some common questions that people ask about that is, 
can I have an in-person funeral? And yes, you can at Seattle HQ, which is a big upgrade from our current situation. Although people have had a wonderful experience doing Zoom layings in for people who can't come in person, and um, we're going to continue to offer those as well. So I just wanted to highlight a couple of our customers. This is one of our first customers that came to us. He was an organic farmer called Amigo Bob, and he actually had educated people on composting for since the 1970s. So this was a natural choice for him as he came to the end of a long illness. He had cancer for over a decade. Um, his wife, Jennifer, gave an interview with People Magazine and she said some beautiful things, including that she knew he'd be happy even in death because he was promoting the health of the plants and all the creatures around. Um, and when Amigo Bob came to us from California, he was transported by a funeral home from California. And we do have folks come to us from other states in the same way fairly often. Um, he came in a casket that his friends and family had decorated and, and Jennifer had written on the side, he loved the earth so much she wanted to become soil, which I always thought was a beautiful idea. And then we also have received feedback about our Zoom laying in ceremonies, which are done by our services team, who are all licensed funeral directors who approach this work with a beautiful amount of heart and personalization for the families. And I love that both of these quotes say that some people who attended the funerals are switching around their own arrangements. I think you know maybe that's the mark of a good funeral. In addition, of course, to honoring the person. So. One big reason that people choose this is the environmental impact of human composting. And prior to the 1860s, people were often buried near their homes in simple cotton shrouds or in simple caskets. And it wasn't until that second half of the 1800s that embalming became a practice and the conventional funeral industry as people understood it in the 20th century came to be. And I talk to people even now who have had experiences where they felt like they had a service pushed on them that they didn't want, or they felt like they didn't understand what they were paying for. And Recompose tries very hard to make sure that they, people who come to us understand what they're getting at what it costs. And I'll talk about the cost in a few slides. But in addition to the personal resonance of Recompose, there's also the environmental impact. For each person who chooses human composting over conventional burial or cremation, one metric ton of carbon is saved from entering the environment. And that comes in because we do not use fossil gas in our process, and that's what powers flame-based cremation. I often talk to people who are very aware that conventional burial has negative environmental impacts because of the hardwood of the caskets or the concrete of a vault, or the land use challenge of a cemetery that exists for a long time, but they aren't aware that from a carbon perspective, flame-based cremation has about the same carbon impact as conventional burial. And that's because of the amount of fossil gas that's required to create the heat in a crematory retort. So this is something that I learned when I first joined and is something that people are starting to keep in mind more when they think about their burial options. And of course, there's also the personal resonance, as I mentioned, for someone like Amigo Bob. And we have all kinds of people come to us. We have obituaries on our website if you want to read about the amazing teachers. We have writers. We have engineers. We have all kinds of people who have this idea that they wanted this for many, many different reasons for because they love the earth or they loved hiking or they wanted to go back to their own garden after they died. There's as many different reasons as there are people. So just to give you some context for how much a metric ton of carbon is, my favorite stat on here is this 40 propane cylinders because I can picture one propane cylinder like you would use to power a gas barbecue. And then you picture a backyard filled with 40 of them. That is the CO2 equivalent of choosing conventional cremation. So it, it does start to add up. And just to give you some more context, there are a lot of people out there who are dying and you know, if, if they really love the choice that they have, if they are really jazzed about where they're gonna be buried or they really like the idea of being cremated, then I'm all about that. This Recompose exists because we want people to have access to this option if they want it. We're not here to push people or pressure people or tell people that their idea isn't good. But I think there are people out there who do want this. So if just 10% of people who at the current time choose cremation chose human composting, we would save 
a whole lot of carbon, the equivalent of over a thousand cars driven for a year, you know, millions of pounds of coal burned. You can see those stats there and these come from the EPA. So it does start to scale. And I didn't wanna quickly address two other green funeral options. I know that this is a series and you may have already heard of some of these, but there's one that is available in Washington called alkaline hydrolysis. It's also called water cremation. And that uses a machine with water and some light chemicals to reduce the body into a sandy material rather like cremated remains. And that's a great option. It also uses one eighth the energy of conventional burial or cremation. And people sometimes choose that because they'd rather, you know, they like the idea of a warm bath better than becoming soil. And that's great. And it can also be an affordable option depending on where you are. And alkaline hydrolysis is legal in something like 30 states now. There's also green burial, which is being buried in a simple cotton shroud or a simple pine box in a designated area of a cemetery where you don't have to have a concrete vault. I believe there are at least eight or 10 green burial cemeteries here in Washington, and that's a great option if that resonates with you. One challenge of green burial is that the green burial cemeteries are often far outside of cities, and when Recompose was first founded, our founder Katrina Stade ran it as a nonprofit called the Urban Death Project because she really wanted an option for people who lived in cities, who didn't have access to land that had green burial, so this is sort of an urban equivalent to green burial. There's also body donation. I know that there's a willed body program at the University of Washington that people really have had good experiences with. And people often ask me, can you choose to have your body donated and choose human composting? And the answer is usually no, because bodies that are donated, for example, to a medical school are embalmed so that the students can use them for a longer period of time to learn from, and then they are either undergo alkaline hydrolysis or they are cremated. So that's, um, that's one very common question. Another common question is, can I donate organs and choose human composting? And the answer is yes. The organs are taken from the body at the hospital before we take it into our care. And then other options that people always ask me about, there's this mushroom suit that got a lot of buzz a couple of years ago. And this is the idea that it would be a shroud that would remove toxins from your body before you would undergo a green burial. And it's a beautiful idea. Uh, I don't think that this is actually in production. We've tried to get these for people who have asked us for them and wanted them. But the good news is that composting removes toxins from the soil and that the microbes that power composting do the same thing. So if that idea resonates with you, this option might be a good option. I also hear from people all the time who are like, I just want to be thrown in the forest and eaten by wolves. <laughs> and um, It's a nice idea, you know, for people that it resonates with. Um, it's not legal anywhere that I know of. There are a couple places <laughs> in the world where there's um, something called sky burial that um, it's not legal in Washington. I think, I don't think it's legal anywhere in the US, but um, yeah, I think human composting is maybe the closest option you're gonna get or maybe a green burial that's out in the forest. And then I also hear from people who want to become a tree. This is a very common idea and there are a lot of different urns where you can put cremated remains and bury it under a tree, or you can scatter your remains on a tree. Um, again, as I said, whatever option resonates with you, that's what you should go with. If you are thinking on a scientific level, human composting allows you to become soil that can nourish the tree and that can literally become part of the environment again, as opposed to cremated remains, which are inert. And Cremated remains require a lot of fossil gas, as I mentioned, to undergo cremation. So those are just a couple of things to keep in mind in terms of thinking about what does becoming a tree mean for me? So what is it like to choose recompose? I'm, not, I'm trying not to get too salesy here, but just from an informational perspective, I wanna give you a sense of what it's like to choose um, us as a funeral home. So as I mentioned, we are a licensed funeral home. We employ four licensed funeral directors. So on a practical level, we operate just like any other funeral home. At the time of death, you can call our main number. It's 206-800-TREE, which is 8733. And we can take your person into our care. And 
we can come to the place of death to pick up the body. We can file the death certificate. We provide hands-on emotional care and support. And we can also help you plan in advance. We have a program called Precompose that we're actually just revamping and should relaunch probably tomorrow. It's been a huge project of mine to make it so that it's easy and straightforward for people to sign up and make arrangements in advance. And we are accepting bodies now. We've been pretty much full since we opened at the end of 2020. Um, another very common question is, what if you're full? What do I do if I die and you don't have a vessel open for me? And that has, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your perspective, that has happened to us where we've had a waiting period and we have chilled storage where we can hold your body until there's a vessel available. And there have been times where we've had to be very clear with family members and say, unfortunately, it's going to be three or four weeks before we can start your person's transformation into soil. And the transformation into soil takes between six and eight weeks. We know that's a long time to wait. If that's not okay with you, we can absolutely connect you with another funeral home. And some families say, you know what, this is really what my person wanted and I'm okay with that weight. And sometimes families say, actually, that's not going to be okay for me. I'm going to choose another option. And that we totally are here to facilitate that. We want you to have the validating option that you choose. Another common question that I get is, you know, what if there was a religious circumstance where a body needed to be buried in a certain number of days? Can Recompose accommodate that? And it depends a little bit on what, what it means to the person because you're kind of never buried if you choose human composting. Um, you know, there might be an instance where in, in the future where we had the capacity for it, if there was availability, then we could maybe place the body into a vessel in three days. So it's a little bit of a conversation between the person and their religious leader and our staff about how can we accommodate what you're really looking to get out of this when there is no literal burial. So as I said, we try to be very straightforward about pricing and the recomposed price costs $7,000. That includes personalized support from our services team of funeral directors who have decades of experience in working with families. It includes transport within King Pierce and Snohomish County, filing of the death certificate, an online obituary, as well as that transformation into soil that takes six to eight weeks, and then the opportunity to either keep or donate the soil. And just to give you some context, the average funeral cost in Washington state for 2021 was $8,500. So, uh, we do offer an additional price for our ceremony, which is $350. So $7,000 is a lot of money, but we're hopeful that it's within the range of other options out there. And it has, you know, some unique benefits such as becoming soil. And, um, you know, our care team is very, very engaged with making the experience what you want. Um, as I mentioned, a, a big philosophy of ours is making sure that you know up front what you're paying for and making sure that you never receive a bill that you didn't expect. And um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been a little bit tough on, on the team side because we don't want the price to be too expensive, but we also wanna pay our people well. So um, you know, we wish we could give this away for free and we want this to be a sustainable business. So if you're interested in learning more, you can visit our website. I wrote our whole website and I promise it's very extensive and I'm adding FAQs every day from talking with people like y'all and making sure that you have the information you need to understand what we're doing and what we're up to. And I also wanted to mention that all of these um, photos throughout today's presentation, including this photo of Mount St. Helens have been from our conservation partner where folks have the option to donate the soil. So this is what I've chosen for my soil. I'm gonna become soil and then go out to, it's called Bell's Mountain. And they use the soil on, for example, they just removed a bunch of invasive blackberry bushes and now they're replanting with native trees using our compost. So sometimes when I have a really hectic day, I just think about being out in the forest someday, helping those trees grow. And that's a really lovely idea. So, um, See, there's a few questions in the chat, so I'll jump to the chat and anyone can also raise their hand and I can, um, you know, answer your questions here. So Eileen says, do we need to deal with a separate funeral home to pick up the body? 
no, you don't. We are a funeral home and we can do all of that within Washington state. Um, the $7,000 price includes transport within King Pierce and Snohomish County. So you can just call our number 206-800-TREE and we will pick up your body and take care of everything else. We also offer transport within the rest of Washington. There is a transport costs associated based on the distance from our facility. And that information is all on our website as well. We also can accept bodies from other states. And in that case, people sometimes will work with the separate funeral home just to do the transport, but we can usually handle everything else. Usually folks will have a funeral home. For example, if you were in California, the funeral home in California would pick up the body, take it to the airport, and then we would pick up the body at the airport here. And it depends on the state exactly how the death certificate works, but our funeral directors will make sure and handle all of that. You don't have to worry about any of that. So Kathy wants to more sit, wants to know more about the ceremony that we offer. So it's a good question, Kathy. Right now, we offer a Zoom version of a laying in ceremony. And the laying in is a bit like a graveside ceremony where we our staff, actually, I'm gonna go back to a picture earlier in my presentation to give you a little bit of context. So you can see here, so you can see here that this, this is some pillows, but this is what the body would look like on the cradle covered in plant material. So during the laying in ceremony, our funeral directors will call everyone together over Zoom. And sometimes there's a reading or sometimes there's music, and then they place the plant material over the body move the body into the vessel, close the vessel, and that marks the transformation into soil beginning. And that's, um, you know, sort of the, similar to what you would do with a graveside service. Um, right now in our current facility in the greenhouse, because we can't have families there in person, it is currently included in our price. But as soon as we transfer to our HQ and our in-person ceremony, option, then it will cost $350. So we're in a little bit of an interim price here where it's currently included, but hopefully no one on the call dies before May. So um, that's a little bit more about the ceremony. And there is an article on our website as well called about the laying in ceremony in the resources section that um, has a lot more information about that. Eileen wants to know, what is the name of the mountain? It's called Bells Mountain. It's run by a nonprofit called Remember Land in Southern Oregon. And that's our conservation partner. Um, and actually, I can drop some links in here, but I'll, I'd have to stop sharing. So I'll just get through the questions and then maybe I can send you all some links. Kathy wants to know, do families wish to have a location where they can go and remember their family member? Good question, Kathy, it really depends. Um, obviously, some people do. And in that case, we've heard of folks who will bring all the soil back. We've had about a half of families who do wanna take all the soil. It fills up about a pickup truck bed, so it is quite a bit of soil. And I talked to a woman fairly recently who planted a tree and she's gonna turn it into a whole grove of trees and that's where she goes to remember her dad. Or we've had people use it on someone's beloved rose garden those kinds of things. So um, sometimes people do. And I also have had people say, you know, I have a plot in a cemetery, can my soil be buried there? And absolutely from a scientific and legal perspective, it could be. Um, it would depend on what the ceremony or what the cemetery thought about it. So I haven't heard of that happening, but there's no reason it could. Can we prepay for the cost? Deborah wants to know. Yes, you can. We have a uh, prepayment option called Precompose. As I mentioned, it's relaunching like today. I just finished the redesign. So um, you might want to check back later this week and then you will be able to prepay for the costs we have. You can either pay the full 7,000 or you can pay monthly at various different levels. And some advantages of prepaying is that as long as you pay it off before the time that you die, then the price won't go up for you. So. That's helpful. Um, Linda wants me to put the pricing page back up. Sure, and we have a whole pricing page on our website that has a lot more information and I just redesigned that as well. So um, it has a lot more context and I can link that as well. Everyone wants to know what are the costs outside the counties that you mentioned? Well, they have a bit of a range. Um, I think that from uh, Spokane, it's close to $1,000. 
but you know, from the counties closer to the city, it can be in the two or $300 range. So it just depends a bit. And that's because our transport team does have to drive all the way out to Spokane, pick up the body and then drive all the way back. It's several hours of work and it can be emotionally demanding, especially if someone dies in the middle of the night. So those are to um, make sure that our teams are being paid fairly. Rosemary wants to know, are you the only provider of composting? Are there others in King County? You know, Rosemary, I don't like talking about our competitors. <laughs> there are a few others and I'll leave it at that. <laughs> and now I'm gonna stop sharing so that I can find a couple of links for y'all. Um, here is our, this is our page that has our pricing. Um, and you can see there's a drop down list of all of what we offer. And there's also links to the transport pricing list for other counties. And then let's see what, oh, someone wanted to have the laying in article. So I'll drop that in as well. Here is the article about the laying in ceremony. And then I'll also link to a little bit more about our forest partner. Here's our section about the forest and that also has a link to their website. Linda says, I came late. Did you talk about the process you use in composting a body? We sure did Linda, that was the whole side, top section. Um, I will link that to you as well. Um, you can see that on our website as well. Terry says, can you say more about your capacity and any backups in getting a body processed? Sure. So. Right now, we have the capacity to turn 16 bodies per month into soil. And we've been about full. We've had some less, some less busy months, but we've been about full since we opened in December of 2020. And we are about to increase our capacity significantly because by July, with our new HQ, we'll have the capacity to turn 50 bodies per month into soil. So backups in getting a body processed there are sometimes, you know, the, the, we say the process takes between six and eight weeks because there is what is called a qualifying threshold. And that means that the environment in the vessel legally by the state is required to reach 131 Fahrenheit for 72 consecutive hours. And sometimes depending on the plant material, the weather, the, the body, that it can take longer to reach that qualifying threshold. So, the only delays would be that our soil scientist, Dr. Lynn Carpenterbox says that this is a living process. And sometimes it does take that full eight weeks, which of course would delay the next person being laid in. But for the most part, we have gotten pretty good at this process and we try to make it as, as expedient as possible while still keeping everything safe. And we absolutely communicate very clearly with the family when they come to us and say, you know, how long is it gonna be? Are you sure that you're okay with waiting this long? Can we help connect you with another funeral home if you're not? Any other questions? I have a question. Sure, Dory. Um, if the composting detoxifies the body, what happens to the toxins? Sure, so the change takes place on a molecular level. So the, the microbes create the heat and it actually breaks down the molecules that break up those toxins. And we are required to test the soil for a whole list of potential environmental toxins. And so every single, it's called an instance, every time we create soil, it is tested and certified by the state to make sure that it's safe. And those levels are all well under EPA safe levels before it goes back to families. So they are um, not completely eliminated, but reduced greatly because the heat breaks down those molecules. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Any other questions for Anna? No. <laughs> I know, I feel like I accidentally tore through my presentation. <laughs> Should I just give it again? We have another 25 minutes. <laughs> I, have, I have another question. When you talk sure. about the amount of soil, uh -huh. 
you said if someone wanted it brought to their house, it was like a truckload. Anyway, so I guess what I'm asking is, what are most people doing with the soil production? Yeah, it's a good question. So if families do want to pick up the entire volume of soil, it they usually are coming to us with either a pickup truck bed or a trailer. And when we first did this, we weren't sure if anyone would want this soil because it's a lot of soil, but we've seen about half of families do want it. And we've had the Amigo Bob, the customer that I mentioned, his wife, Jennifer, came up from California, put it on a trailer, and he was an organic farmer, right? So she drove back to California, stopping off at a farm here. They took a scoop, stopping off at another friend's farm, gave them a scoop. So um, that was one creative way to do it. Um, we've also had a lot of people who loved gardening who will use it on their yards. Um, also, we've had some folks who would prefer to be buried on their own land, but it's very hard to do in Washington. You have to make your land a cemetery and it's very expensive. So this is one way to do it that's, you know, comparatively less expensive. So, you know, they'll just be buried as if they were a body. Um, you, it can be scattered. There are um, some, I, I haven't heard of people doing this with the full volume of soil, but I know that you can scatter the soil, for example, in, I think it's called navigable waterways, like off a ferry. So people will take home the little container and then do a scattering off of the ferry or on a beach. Um, it looks just like soil. You know, if you wanted to scatter the, the small volume of the soil on a, a beloved hiking trail, no one would ever know. Um, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> How large is the that container you show? That's yeah. Large. So yeah, let me. I mean, there's no scale on that image, but it it's 64 ounces, so it like looks like a little. Um, I'm trying to think if I have one in my office here. Actually, it's like about the size of this flower pot. This is about how big okay. it is. Okay. Yeah. So someone mm -hmm. wanted to give, so you do something else in the soil and then have just a small pot. Do right. You know? Folks will often donate the soil to our conservation forest and then take home you know, a couple of these one, there's one included in the 7,000 price, and then you can get more of them for like $25 or something. And do, is there a yeah. fee for sending the rest of the soil to the conservation for? There is not, there's not a fee for the donation. No. Thank you. Anna, mm -hmm. um, I just wanted to share my uh, personal experience. Can everybody- Oh, hear? thank you, Ellen. Uh, yeah, so um, our neighbor, um, recently passed away and he um, had it, you know, did the route uh, recompose. And um, after he, after his soil was ready, um, his husband let everybody know, all the friends and family that were interested. And once they had brought the soil back, I think it was like just out in front of his house and everybody just came by that was interested. Everybody just came by with buckets and just took whatever amount they wanted. And uh, my neighbor was a huge um, Japanese maple lover. And so, you know, there's Japanese maples everywhere every, in everybody's yards, right? And so like, you know, he's um, under our two Japanese maples right now, which I know that he would just love. So that was just, you know, one of the options of a way to handle it. So it was lovely. That's beautiful, Ellen. Thank you so much for sharing that. What Absolutely. a lovely idea. Mm -hmm. I have another one <laughs> about the uh, uh, ceremony at the location. Mm -hmm. Once you know you open up space, and then you mention the new space in mm -hmm. the Seattle area, Soto District. Like about how many people can it accommodate? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, this is actually a a big um, challenge of finding space. I believe that we our space is going to have capacity for about thirty people. Okay. Which of course is not huge. I, I would love it if it was bigger, but we ended up deciding that having space for the actual composting was what we had to, sure. you know, choose over ceremony space. But there is also absolutely, I could see someone having a funeral at a church or, you know, at an event space and then coming to our facility for more like the graveside service. Yeah, good. Thank you. Oh, Linda says, does anyone know if pea patches allow this? So I would not recommend using the soil on food products. Um, there's no scientific reason to not do it, but actually 
it's it's we just don't have enough science to absolutely know 1000 percent that it's safe if if in the instance like so many things would have to go wrong for it to be dangerous you know like if someone didn't know that they had a dangerous prion disease and then they got composted and then they went to a pea patch like it's probably not going to happen but for example in colorado there's actually a stipulation in the law that says if you are going if you are growing food crops for a commercial instance, then you can't use compost from human composting. So long and short of it is I wouldn't recommend using this on food. But if they grow flowers at the peat patch, then probably sure. Okay. Any other questions? Anna, this is Deborah. Can you show that uh, slide again that compares, like you said, the four propane cylinders and then you have three others that went rather Sure. Quick. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Let's bring it back up again. So this is from a calculator that the EPA makes, this one right here. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, it's it's interesting thinking of, you know, what 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 does that mean, my carbon impact? And, you know, I feel like people who, you know, we're often people who drive a, an electric car or, you know, use reusable bags, but a lot of people aren't even aware of the carbon impact of um, conventional funeral options. So that's an interesting part of my job is educating people. And I learn more about it all the time. Emily asks, is there a charge to store if you are full? No, we don't charge for storage. Um, you know, we, we wish we had more capacity and we're working on building it. So we're happy to have people come to us. Polly wants to know if a couple is making prepayments, can the accrued amount be used for either one of the couples at the time of death? So the way that our prepayment is set up, you create a trust for a specific person. So in simple terms, no, it is assigned to a person, um, but you are eligible for a 90% refund. So I guess there would be an instance where you could move the money over to the other person by taking it out of your trust and putting it in a new trust. But in simple terms, the trust is individual to a person. And I guess I alighted over that a little bit. So. When you join our program Precompose, you are creating a funeral trust and you have the ability to have a 100% refund within the first 30 days of signing up if you change your mind. Or you can have a 90% refund anytime before death or after death if you decided you didn't want to do it. So it's um, pretty low risk. And then those that other 10% is retained for our operational costs. And this is also all over our website. So I will drop that in the chat as well. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Okay. Yes. Uh, I didn't know if I was muted. This is Lori. Uh, I came up with a, an idea. It sounds a little gruesome, but suppose somebody has signed up and uh, for this prepayment, but mm -hmm. then they die and you can't get the body. Say a ship sinks, a plane crashed in the ocean, so you can't reclaim the body. The body's gone. What happens then? Yeah, so then they would get that 90% refund that I mentioned. If for any reason we can't perform services, they are eligible for that 90% refund. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks, everyone, for these great questions. All right. If there are no other questions, um, thank you again, Anna, for this presentation. I hope everyone has learned much about um, human composting. Um, just so everyone knows, and, and thank you to Anna for letting us record this presentation. So um, I will send this recording to all of you who are online today, as well as those who weren't um, able to make it today. Uh, so that will be sent to you. Um, if there are no other questions, um, again, thank you everyone for joining today online with us. I just want to remind everyone that we have our last um, part of the series next week on Monday.
uh, from People's Memorial Association with funeral options. And of course, um, today's uh, presentation was the fourth part of the series that we had this month and um, next week will be the last. Can you believe it? It's the last one. Um, again, thank you so much, Anna, for, um, for your wonderful presentation. Um, and they were excellent questions out there, everyone. So um, um, again, I hope we all learned from this. And, uh, and just so everyone knows also, if you are unfamiliar with NEST, um, we are a nonprofit organization that supports older adults to remain in their homes as long as possible. And the focus of our organization is connecting um, with each other um, uh, in, within the community. So uh, we have connected today with, with Anna and learned about um, human composting. And we are very fortunate to have this today. Um, again, everyone, thank you so much. If, of course, if you have any questions, please feel free to email info at nestseattle.org. Um, if you have any questions uh, for Anna, I, just send them over to me and then I will send them over to Anna. Again, this uh, program was recorded, so I will send this out to you as well. Thank you so much, everyone. Have a wonderful day and um, hope to see you next week. Thank you, Anna. Thanks, Thanks everyone. Thanks, Ness, for having me. Bye, everyone. Bye. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.